Okay, the article that we're going to be reading now is Through a Filtered Lens, an authorised picture taking of people with dwarfism in public spaces. Okay, sorry, I'm getting a bit crazy at the moment. Okay, let's get started. This article is by Leslie Ellis. Okay, the abstract. People with dwarfism often encounter discrimination in their daily interactions with strangers. Daring, harassment, and infantilization are some of the behaviors that they have reported to encounter. Through two qualitative research studies conducted in 2013 and 2015-16, it was revealed that people with dwarfism also experience strangers taking unauthorized pictures of them. This article explores this phenomenon in depth utilizing the perspective of individuals who have experienced it firsthand and analyzing the relevant socio-historical influences. These include the history of the photographic exploitation of, the, of abnormal bodies and the cultural construction as a dwarf, of a dwarf as an object of entertainment. This article, this article engages gaze theories in gender, race, and ethnicity studies, as well as discussion of full cult interpretation of Pano, sorry, of um, Pano, Pen Panopaton? <laughs> oh, I can't read. Ah. Pano, no, Panopticon, Panopticon. Okay, Zigon. Posting that the advent of the cell phone camera in the 21st century has altered how abnormal bodies are recorded with an oppressive and ideological belief. Okay. Move on to the introduction. Woo. Okay. People with dwarfism, otherwise labeled as people with restricted growth or little people, often encounter discrimination in their daily interactions with strangers in public spaces. Their small stature and bodily differences can produce strong reactions towards them shock, pity, disgust, and, evil hate and even hatefulness and violence. Daring, harassment, infantilization, and teasing are some of the behaviors people with dwarfism have reported to encounter as they navigate through the social world. Research conducted in 2013 and 2015 to 16 found that people with dwarfism also experience strangers taking unauthorized pictures of them in public spaces. The ubiquitous, ubiquitous, sorry. Edge states that a, that a picture is worth a thousand words, but does the act of taking a picture also reveal layers of social meaning and highlights ways that disabledism is experienced in interpersonal interactions? Okay. This article explores the unauthorized picture taking of people with dwarfism in public spaces through the perspectives and insights of those who have experienced this phenomenon firsthand. The data presented here was generated during two qualitative studies in 2013 and 15 to 16 through semi-constructive interviews and focus groups. This unique experience demands analysis and brings together several separate spheres of sociological, sociological sorry, study in literature. These spheres include history of the photographic exploitation of disabled people, Okay. <laughs> cool. Nice. Okay. Continuing. Um, <laughs> Agile with disabled bodies. The cultural construction of the dwarf body as an object of entertainment and how cell phone cameras alter the way actors interact with the social with the visual social world referencing Paul Colt's perception of panopticon. An analysis of data that detail these experiences demonstrates the complex interaction of socio-historical influences, which produces the dwarf body as a photographic object to be gazed upon and recorded. This article is divided into four parts. First, a comprehensive review of relevant literature 
and research will be outlined, including an account of the cultural and historical representations of people with dwarfism. This will assist in contextualizing how the experience of unauthorized picture taking occurs within specific social and cultural conceptions of dwarf bodies. The section will also explore the gaze of other abnormal bodies, <sighs> sorry, and how it is created and operates as an offensive force, manifesting in various visual forms, including staring and photography. A discussion of the racialized and sexualized gaze is, gaze is included as part of this inquiry. Not as analogous to the gaze of disabled bodies, but as a demonstration of how the gaze functions as institutionally structured inequalities and oppressive ideologies. Oh, hello. How, like, I hope your day is doing well. At the moment, I'm reading my second article of the stream, which is uh, about um, how people with dwarfism are um, interpreted by the general public and how their um and how they handle that in their daily lives and what people generally do which isn't so nice to them so yeah it's going to be an interesting read especially since i don't really know anybody who has any particular case of dwarfism so yeah it'll be an interesting time feel free to comment or chat and i will respond to you but i will be reading this for the most part so yeah, thank you, thank you for following. Okay, I'm just gonna continue reading. Feel free to chat and I will answer, but I, I will be reading. Okay, I'm listening, nice. <laughs> okay, um, what was I up to? A review of methods in metathology applied to the generation of data will be provided. That is, I'm going to skip this part because it's not very interesting. It's just like the, the bloody bars, this is a study, this is how it's conducted sort of thing. I'm going to get to the meat of it. The first paragraph is called Dwarfism, Historical Beliefs, Roles and Labels. The history of objectification and the creation of dwarf bodies is imperative to, to outline in order to provide context to the experience of unauthorized picture taking. This history demonstrates how the specific roles and representations of the dwarf body have been used to other and isolate them, resulting in specific forms of disabilism and oppression. An individual is scientifically and socially purported to have dwarfism. Sorry, they have an impairment. They have an impairment that causes their height to be four ten or less. The majority of the over 200 types of genetic differences that cause dwarfism also produce bodily differences in proportions and bone and muscle structure. While each impairment is specific in its nature and effects on the body, dwarfism is an umbrella term that is often used to encompass all people who fall within this category. The term with dwarfism has, was chosen for this research project it is, as it is the most universally recognized in the English language and maintains historical relevance to the term dwarf. The people with dwarfism have always have been culturally defined and represented for countries as, monolith, as a monolith category. Um, okay, Jerbo claims that short stature is one of the oldest sources for the human perception for the perception of human difference. And generally, it has been a source of stigmatization. Very true. <laughs> Even in today's society. Even with it, when it isn't dwarfism, just general differences in stature is what we notice first about the person that we're meeting or looking at. It's, it's the first thing that we see, and it's the first thing we, that we normally comment on as well. So, yeah, it's very interesting. While every society was treated has treated dwarfism differently, Throughout history, there has been an overreaching belief that people with dwarfism are separate from the rest of humanity, a different species or race closer to gods, mythical beings or animals rather than humans. The belief that people with dwarfism are non-human 
or imposition of non-human qualities was propagated from ancient Egypt in the early 20th century. And ancient myths and, religious, and religions supported this view, depicting people with dwarfism as symbols of fertility, evil, mischief, and goodness, linking them to magic and godly powers. Yeah, it is very interesting. I completely agree. Um... <laughs> It has been contended that in ancient that in ancient Egypt, people with dwarfism were revered and attributed with high intelligence. Biblical accounts associated them with deviance and earthly sin, while fictional characters of dwarves in fairy tales and literature appropriated the idea that people with dwarfism have connections to things that are not of this earth. The manifestations of these beliefs have led people with dwarfism to occupy unique cultural roles in history. From being kept as pets in the courts of kings and queens in the Middle Ages to being displayed as freaks as, at shows in the 19th century. As Gerber summarizes, people with dwarfism have been employed for amusement and diversion, court jesters, circus ex exhibits, and performance of pets and mascots of powerful, prestigious people. Sorry. Fictional literature has often used the bodily features of people with dwarfism as metaphors depicting dwarf characters as outsiders, bitter and resentful of the ridicule, ridicule they experience. In film, the dominant imagery of representations of people with dwarfism had been with a numerous fantastical or mocking themes. The most famous depictions, the Munchkins in The Wizard of Oz, animating dwarfs and Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, and the, Lim and the Oompa Loompas from Willy Wonka and the Child... Willy Wonka... I think it's Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, but... I guess in this article, it's called Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory. Anyway, people feature people with dwarfism as otherworldly fictional beings. The proliferation of these representations demonstrates a desire to look at a dwarf bodies and conceive them in, in precise imagery, perhaps, perhaps even more than other abnormal bodies. Disability studies academic Tom Shakespeare, who has dwarfism, and writes, several times a year, I get rung up by a TV researcher and interrogated to death as to whether I, whether it would be a good idea to make a film about, about <laughs> dwarfs and, and sex, dwarfs and patanomon, famous dwarfs, sad dwarfs, happy dwarfs, getting their legs lengthened, dwarf actors, dwarf teenagers, dwarf babies. Yeah, so this is even coming from somebody who's just widely known as somebody in the media who has dwarfism, and he's asked a lot of invasive and, quite frankly, rude questions and rude suggestions because of the fact, because of the way that people with dwarfism have always been perceived. Okay, it can be positioned that there are no other that there is no other impairment group that carries such distinct cultural history. While it has been documented, the cultural history of the dwarf plays a significant role in many experiences of people with dwarfism in public places that include discrimination, teasing, infantilization, and violence. The experience of unauthorized picture taking has not yet been a subject of analysis, predominantly because it appears to have developed only in recent years. But the proliferation of the cell phone camera use, before providing accounts of this experience as detailed by the study, particularly Sorry. Before providing accounts of this experience, as detailed by the study participants, it is fruitful to delve into the several relevant bodies and issues and areas of the study. Next review of the ways in which abnormal bodies have been the subject of the gaze in various visualized forms, including staring and photography, will be forwarded. Okay. The gaze involved from ideals and of normalcy and enacted through both interpersonal and structural oppression as essential influence of unauthorized picture taking of people of dwarfism. Okay, so that's just legal awful shit. Okay, moving on. The next, the next paragraph is called Staring in the Gaze of the Abnormal Body. I think it'll be quite interesting.
The gaze of the abnormal or physically different body is constituted by a myriad of, of forces that operate to visually identify and devalue people's abnormalities, creating specific hierarchies of what is visually acceptable and desirable. Interpersonal experiences of staring have been attributed to be one of the one of the primary ways the gaze is directed towards disabled people who have noticeable differences in their bodies. What book is this? Oh, this one isn't a book. It's an academic article by um, by Leslie Ellis. It's a it's a study that was done. Um, yeah, it was a study done with um it was it took people with dwarfism and interviewed them on their experiences socially and just how people generally interacted with them and what interesting experiences they had interacting with people in public and the analysis which they're doing in here is on, pe on people with um, dwarfism who have been photographed without their permission because of the way that they look. It also does some analysis on the history of people with dwarfism and how they were interpreted by human society and perhaps how that affected their quality of life. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I, I mean, in the title, I did specify that it was an academic reading, so it's just for like social sciences and that sort of thing. I do also do novel readings. I am currently doing the um the the book thief on a different stream, but this one is sort of like an academic article sort of stream. So it's going to be very informative and interesting either way, but. Yeah, I hope you stick around, even even if it's not a book or the thing that you expected. But yeah, I hope you enjoy it. Feel free to comment on anything that you want me to talk about specifically regarding the article or anything else for that matter. Okay. Um, da -da -da -da. Where did I lose myself? Okay. Staring a seemingly intimate and personal interaction has been theorized as part of a structured ideology of normality, while being disguised as natural and inevitable. Tearing has been reported by people with dwarfism as one of the most common experiences when in public places. Apollon summarizes, all dwarfs must live with the constant stares, curiosity, and often gross or rude comments and, and people of average size proportions around them as they as the explicit reminders of their difference. Are you in college? Yeah, I'm at university, as I call it, where I'm from. <laughs> Sorry, this is very, it's an interesting difference. Do you mean college as in high school or college as in university? Because yes, university, not high school anymore, no. <sighs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um... Da, 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 da. Where was I up to? Staring at visually apparent bodies has been linked to disgust, a desire for an individual distance to distance themselves from who they are, encountering and a one-on-one -on -one interaction that reinforces the social and cultural belief that disabled people are less human, less worthy of autonomy and respect. It has been argued to be a direct display of superiority. As Hugh says, to be looked at is to experience a loss of power and the feeling of play of power on the surface of the body. But has the gaze been directed towards disabled people or those considered deformed form this differentiation? Both Hughes and Davis contend that modernity through control of aesthetics reinforced by the gaze and rooted in the medicalization of disabled people's bodies has defined and created what is disabled and abnormal, and thus worthy of a stare. Hughes forwards that this definition has founded, is founded in the drive to identify and eliminate any differences perceived in the body and mind. In his view, the oppression and alternity of disabled people is closely connected to the negative perception, perceptional constitution of impairment in the visual culture of postmodernity. A lot of fancy words in that sentence. <laughs> Moving on. The visual culture Hugh examines is one of which aesthetics is linked to morality. It is constitutive of moral and aesthetic discourage. The gaze on disabled people's bodies, reflected in strong staring, is part of a larger gaze 
that continually pathologizes and, the, and others their bodies, seamlessly merging medically defined dis, dis, sorry, defined defiancy with aesthetics. Davis examines the origin of the concept of normality. Ah, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, there might be a big delay with my with my stream. I struggled with that before and I'm not entirely sure where it's coming from. So yeah, there might be a little bit of an issue with um responding to comments and that sort of thing. I will try my best, but it might be an issue. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there is a little a little delay. <sighs> yeah. Oh well. I mean I, I hope that doesn't change your experience too much, but okay. I'm going to continue reading, but yeah, hopefully that doesn't mess with it too much. Okay. That is the origin. It's fine. Okay. That's good. I'm glad that I'm not lagging too much. After all, my computer isn't very powerful at all. I haven't, um, yeah, I haven't been streaming for very long, so I've just got a very, very basic setup so yeah and considering buying a proper microphone because they probably sound like I'm speaking into a tin can at the moment but um yeah I'm just seeing how it goes and if I'm going to continue to do this long term so who knows maybe I'll get better equipment and I won't have to deal with this hopefully okay thank you <laughs> the sound is okay that's great I'm, I'm glad that it isn't terrible because I Every every time I do my stream, I always do like multiple sound checks, and they're like, "Ah, this sounds terrible." Yeah, <laughs> which isn't great for a stream in which I'm reading for the whole time. So, yeah. Oh well, okay. <laughs> I think I'll get better equipment eventually, but it is quite expensive. So, I might. Yeah. Whenever I think about getting like a better microphone, I'm like. Oh, but they should just get a better computer entirely. That would fix a lot of issues. But then it's like, oh, but a microphone might be more important and computers are very expensive. Uh, yeah, it's a big it's a big deal to me personally. But you know, it's it's fine. That's fine. Um I would go on around because I need to keep reading. Ah. Okay. Um Da, 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 da. Where, where was I off it? Still associated with defiance. You, okay, there were, were eugenicy. Perfect, perfect place to take off from. Eugenic beliefs about the origin and development of impairments, <laughs> development of impairments in the mind and body, linked to sin, evil, and generosity to disabled people, whose bodies are shaped or moved in abnormal ways. This belief justifies the power of the gays to control, limit, and patrol disabled people. Behind this staring and the underlying belief that impairment is inherently negative and should be eradicated. As Hughes writes, this point of view assumes the ultimate commensurability of all discourses, the march of progress towards a synthesis or a happy ending, the closure of alternative through the annihilation of difference and absolute redemption in authenticity. That is a very scary way to think. Ah, yeah, I, I was talking a little while before about um, it's very scary how people think sometimes that um, due to somebody's differences they shouldn't exist or that um that they're worth more than they are simply because they have a difference in their in the way that they choose to exist or not even the way that they choose to exist in the way that they simply do exist and that they are lesser than them. And just because they need help that they aren't worth as much and that they don't contribute to society. I don't think many, I don't think, da, 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 do think, yeah, yeah, a lot of people are quite stupid. I, I agree with you. <laughs> they just feel and react, yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of people do that. It's, it's not great. I mean, I can understand that there is something, I think there's something inherent about people who look different that makes us want to react to them. But it normally comes from a place of initial curiosity and the reactions of people around us interpret whether that feeling going forward is hateful or whether it's um, whether it has any connotations or anything like that. 
it's to do with people's reactions and how, the beliefs that you're pushed into from a young age and what you, you know, what you perceive things to be later on. Whether you perceive difference as a gift or something that needs to be eradicated, it, it all depends on the environment you had growing up or the types of media that you're exposed to. So, yeah, but generally that comes down to society and society kind of bad. Like, uh, <laughs> as you learn from, like, um, from studying social sciences and health and social stuff, it's, um, you learn very quickly that society kind of not great. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to continue to read. Yeah. It's not great that people react to things just on instinct. I think, mm, yeah, the best thing you can do is um, learn about something. All it takes is like a quick Google search and you'll be better off than you were before. So all about education, baby. The individual stare transforms and is part of a larger gaze because it represents specific ideology beliefs in the disabled body and in the case of understudy, the dwarf body, gaze theories have been developed to understand how visualization and aesthetics are integrated into structures of power and prove valuable to analyze the reference to the issue of the underlying study. Okay, the next paragraph is called Gazing at the Other, Visuals of Patriarchy and Racism. All the good stuff. <laughs> okay. Gaze theories, gaze, <laughs> gaze, <laughs> gaze theories argue how oh, certain groups are represented visually. Yeah, yikes, big yikes. <laughs> yeah. mm. There could be someone knocking on my door, but I'm not entirely sure. Anyway, yeah, it is a big yikes. How do you feel about the patriarchy? Um... It's an interesting topic, which a lot of people have opinions on. I believe it exists most definitely. I mean, yeah, people don't like things which they don't have any control over. Um, and that includes men in general society. It's always sort of older beliefs that always resurface that sort of infringe on process and on progress that is currently happening. Like for example, Road versus Wade is a big example of that. It's not it's not even about yeah. The patriarchy, it exists, it it's still there. I think it always will be to some extent. We're improving and it's gotten a lot better. And um in the past, I guess uh twenty to forty years, the patriarchy has more taken its form in a more like in a social context rather than a legal or even sometimes rights context. It's always been social and how people view, react and um, in connotations that people who are female presenting are placed under. And it's the same thing. But I guess now, it, yeah, but it also depends on the society you live in as well. In some cultures, it's definitely more prominent than others. So in like Western society, like America, England, Australia, New Zealand, that kind of thing, it's it's not as prominent. But in third world countries or countries which um have corrupt governments, that type of progress isn't very societal. It, it occurs in like little pockets everywhere. So you still have people with very old and discriminatory beliefs, which still make up the majority. And there isn't any legal progress that gets pushed through. And there's still these really terrible beliefs and things that keep happening, which are outside of the control of women that live there. <sighs> yeah, it's not great. Uh, people who say that it doesn't exist, it's like, sir, please, <laughs> please. <laughs> take a take a look at history and how it exists you can't something just doesn't magically disappear everything has cultural implications and the patriarchy is definitely one of them yeah it's in the same way that um corsets aren't wearing worn as often they were sort of a staple back in the victorian era but people still have quite negative connotative opinions on them and that's not because they're particularly damaging to you it's because of the amount of propaganda that was put in there to like make women's fashion oppressive because 
back then the industry was almost entirely run by women. And so men would look down on this because, you know, women were inferior. They couldn't do things as well as we could. And so a completely woman run industry, which promoted the, the independence of women was something that they didn't like, even if that's not what they thought corsets were oppressive. No, corsets weren't oppressive, but people putting down the idea of corsets were oppressive because corsets aren't inherently damaging in terms of like health. And they don't cause any long-term effects either, especially if they're worn correctly. It, yeah, most, but you see in articles and stuff, oh, actress passes out because she's worn a corset for a too long period of time. Or look at this fad, people are wearing corsets and it's terrifying. They're going to hurt themselves or it's so deadly. But it actually came from um, patriarchal shit back in the, um, the 1800s when... Um, men saw that women were ruling the fashion industry and pushing to have this type of independence on um, the way that they expressed themselves and the way that they dressed. And, they men, and the men were essentially like, look, corsets are damaging because they thought intuitively that they didn't want women to progress and become more independent because the fashion industry was at that time, a symbol of women's independence because they were so prevalent in it. There were entire like companies that were run by women. And in the 1800s, that was almost unheard of. So having an industry that's run by women was highly criticized back then because it was run by women and it was highly scrutinized by the male population. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. And that's why um, even nowadays, people have a negative view of it. Hello. <laughs> I hope you're having a nice day. <laughs> we were reading an article on dwarfism, but now we're talking about the patriarchy and corsets. What's the topic? I mean, we're talking about like corset stuff at the moment because, you know, conversations about the patriarchy and stuff, but, you know, it is what it is. I was um, reading an article on dwarfism and that sort of thing because it's interesting, but yeah. <sighs> I'm a feminist, go women. Yeah. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Yo. Thinking that people should be equal? What a controversial opinion, am I right? Whoa. <laughs> girl power. Yeah. Let's go, go girl. Go piss girl. Wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> I don't fucking know. I don't know. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. So in short, corsets weren't used to oppress women they were criticized heavily by men in the Victorian era because they were viewed as a symbol of women's independence. Okay, we're gonna get on with the article, which isn't about feminism, it's about ableism. Okay, we're going to continue reading. Gay, ther gay theories argue that how certain groups are represented visually and look in public spaces contribute to both individual experiences, eh, experiences of discrimination and institutionalization systemic oppression. Oh, hello. <laughs> Another person. Yo, we're currently reading an article on dwarfism and how it's interpreted in public spaces. Feel free to comment anything. I'll probably respond to it. Is ableism a good thing or a bad thing? It's a bad thing. Sort of like how racism and sexism, it sounds so complicated. It is an academic article. <laughs> um, ableism is a bad thing. It's a, essentially discrimination against people of different ability. For example, um, people in wheelchairs have a different ability of mobility, so they aren't able to walk in the same way that you and I can. They have to wheel around and stuff like that. People with um, with certain variants of autism, people, I guess, in this article of dwarfism. Dwarfism isn't inherently disabling. They're more disabled by, like, the environment around them and it being hard for them to reach things or, like, participate in certain activities because of, like, height, height and weight restrictions and that sort of thing. But, yeah, generally ableism is just, like... um discriminating against people because of like their ability and that sort of thing. Okay, I'm going to go into the article. You might learn a little bit about ableism as we go along because it is academic. Do you mean 
Do I have to pass? Two points or is like... Mm. What do you mean by a pass? Do you mean like a pass to use slurs against? <laughs> to use slurs which inherently against people with disabilities? I do have, um, I have friends who have disabilities and yes, I guess they do use the slurs. But, um, like, can I get away with hating people? Hmm. So if you have a disability, it's not nice. No, I don't, it's generally not good to, like, have to be hateful towards people for their disability, even if you are disabled yourself. If the reason why you dislike someone is because they're disabled, that's a pretty terrible attitude to have. <laughs> Maybe don't do that. That's not great. No, don't do this. Bad. Bad commenter. How dare you. <laughs> okay. <sighs> Continuing to read. Oh, we are going to talk a little bit about feminism. Nice. <laughs> Research in feminist studies have, has extensively outlined how representation of women's bodies illuminates culturally specific attitudes and beliefs that further regulate women as lesser than men, upholding a pa patriarchal structures of power. Theorists have documented how racist ideologies have been used to provide visual proof and imagery to justify the beliefs of the superior whiteness. Okay, so it's talking about um, ableism in the context of it being similar to racism and sexism, which I think is a good, relatively good comparison to have, especially in the same context. So it's sort of in the way that, um, yeah, there was a lot of like pictures and stuff taken of different cultures and sort of like blackface and that sort of thing, how like people of different races were considered sort of like a visual marvel or something that needed to be stared at and like, oh, they're different from us, they must be a different species kind of thing. It's just dehumanizing and demoralizing and only bad shit can really come from it. So it's not great. Okay, I'm going to continue reading. Each of these theoretical understandings of the gaze can be utilized to understand how it, how it is enacted upon people with dwarfism. And by gaze, I mean like spelt with a Z as in like how you look at people. Not the other one. Okay. Um, okay. However, it is important to note that people with dwarfism can experience multiple gazes depending on their belonging to different depressed groups. In a sing <laughs> and as a singular theory of specific gaze is inadequate to encompass this complexity. The male or patriarchal gaze has been explored through feminist theory and analysis in a particular focus in film and media studies. Researchers have investigated how film advertisement and photographs have been deliberately created which se to sexualize and objectify women's bodies and, depict <laughs> and depicts either subtly or blatantly images of rape, violence, submission. These images were, create were part of the creation of a woman attributing to specific traits is synonymous with femaleness. Oh, dang, everyone left. <laughs> you talk about feminism and everybody leaves. Nice. <laughs> Images were proliferated to create and perpetuate patriarchal ideals for the separation and dominance of male sexuality and power. Parallels can be found in the dwarf body as it is visualized and represented to be gazed upon. The dwarf body has been used as a visual metaphor, a way to create a fantasy world, an explicit symbol of oddity and difference. Their size and any disproportion represented in their bodies are emphasized to clearly outlines a viewer, a non-dwarf, who looks upon a dwarf body and assigns meaning without regard to individuali individuality, sorry, or even humanity. Oh, hello. How are you doing? I hope you're doing well. At the moment, I'm reading an article on um, dwarfism and how they're perceived by the general public and sort of like the history of it. So feel free to comment or ask questions and I will respond to them. But I will be reading. So yeah, okay. I'm gonna get on with the article. Um, 
The gaze of the dwarf body can be linked to the, patriarch the, 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 the patriarchal gaze as it, as it is tinged with both desire and contempt. Thumbs up. Good. <laughs> cool. It explores how people with dwarfism are portrayed in freak shows, analyzing the similarities of how child actors, such as Shirley Temple, were fetishized. She coins this commodification of cuteness, a designed mixture of sexualization and desexualization, where small childlike bodies are needing protection and available for ownership. Examples in literature and, and filmed real dwarf characters are often abused, ridiculed, demonstrated, underlying aggression towards their deviant bodies in the same way that they are depicted as pets, to offer assistance and comfort to their non-dwarf owners. In a similar way to the patriarchal case, if you, the dwarf body is desired as a possession while treated with disdain and denied full humanity. The sexualization of female dwarf bodies constitutes the patriarchal gaze and the abnormal gaze, creating a precise image that represents their bodies as simultaneously freak and available for heterosexual male arousal. The female dwarf body is an erotic symbol that has been proliferated through imagery. I thought it came from the Healing Heart topic. Oh, the Healing and Heart and Recovery is the um was the first article that I read. Right now I'm in the through a filtered lens topic. Uh, one class this one if I join. Um. Uh, I don't think so. I mean, I'm doing academic readings and that sort of thing, so I don't know if you'd be interested. What does it say? Um, the the title of this article, which is the second one that I've read in the stream, is Through a Filtered Lens, an Unauthorized Picture Taken of People with Dwarfism in Public Spaces. That's the extended title. What well, was the consensus in the last article? Um, the last article was on um, people... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the consensus in the last article was on the opinion of those who were struggling with mental illnesses and the differences in treatment that they received from general safe spaces and stuff within the community as compared to more clinical um, environments such as mental institutions and well-being wardens and hospitals and that sort of thing. So um, the general consensus in the last article was about um, was that a mixture is good and that we still have a long way into understanding um, how to treat mental illness efficiently in the in a clinical setting, but for now we will continue to improve and learn. And that um, instead of looking for a cure to mental illness, so something where we can just you know get rid of their their illness entirely, we need to learn to um, recover in rather than recover from. So recovering in requires you to understand and learn and grow alongside your illness and learn to cope with it, as opposed to recovering from, which completely eliminates the disease, which isn't possible in most circumstances of mental illness. So, yeah, it's just a general consensus of that was just to like, just to learn to recover within and to change our definition of what it means to recover and to learn and to heal in those types of settings. Okay, I'm going to continue on with this article. I hope you find it as interesting. Um, yeah, okay, I'm going to continue on. Now, I have a tattoo that says, the darkness carried in the heart cannot be cured by moving the body from pla from by place to another. Yeah, that's a that's a good... Oh, it sort of relates to a reading that I did, I think it was my last stream, and I did it on an article about um, families with deaf children in Mexico, and they talked about their, um, like their process of having to move from one clinic to another and another, because people didn't have proper advice, there was no consensus on what they should do, because there was so little support for people who suffer from deafness in Mexico, so, yeah. It was a very interesting take. So I guess you could see the same thing with mental health. So by moving yourself, just by taking the action, the step of attempting to heal doesn't necessarily heal you, but going through the journey 
of healing and understanding what it means. Yeah, it's a it's a beautiful quote. It's a nice tattoo. Yeah, good job. Okay, I'm going to continue reading the article because I keep getting distracted by interesting conversation. Why do my commenters have to be interesting? <laughs> okay, I'm going to continue to read. <sighs> Examples in literature and film reveal dwarf characters are often abused, ridicule, ridiculed, demonstrating an underlying aggression towards their deviant bodies. At the same time, they are depicted as depicted as pets to offer assistance and comfort to their non-dwarf owners. Oh, I've already read this part. <laughs> okay, I'm going to move on. Okay, a female dwarf body. Hello, new person. <laughs> okay, the female dwarf body as an erotic symbol has been proliferated through imagery and social worlds of women with dwarfism. There are large quantities of pornography that feature female dwarf performers and other acts is, and often portrayed as midgets. Um, and midget impersonators that, delivers, uh, that deliberately sexualize their bodily features. That's kind of fucked up. <laughs> but I guess like, I guess in the dimension of pornography and like um and sexual gaze, like humanity's also been always been kind of fucked up. That's not really surprising to me. Uh, nice. Okay, next part. Gaze theories and race and ethnicity studies have demonstrated how a gaze on colored bodies contracted with visually specific ways is a part of the development of white of the white or colonial gaze. Tied, tied to a systematic structure that idolizes an idol sorry an ideologies of racism, the visualization of racial differences, often in the form of crude measurements and exaggeration of physical features, as an essential element of scientific racism, fabricated physical differences between black or white bodies, used to justify and valorize slavery and colonization. It's something that I never really associated, but um, if you think about people or like um, or characters in media and that sort of thing, if you think about you know how the West portrayed people of color in shows and stuff, you know when they when they made like an impersonations or um or caricatures of them, they all they, it was always just like, like um making their features more and more extreme to make them seem more and more different from them. Like, for example, if you think about blackface, their interpretation actually looks nothing like people of color. It's just very extreme. They make everything look so extreme and different and inhuman. It's it's very, very strange. It's it's not good. Yeah, so I guess that's what it's touching on. It's something that I think a lot of people have witnessed throughout their lives, but it's not something that you really think about. So... Yeah, that's that's good commentary. Okay, moving on. These specific findings were discussed and theorized in similar ways to how disabled bodies are described. A strategic part of eugenic belief systems asserted that interracial progeny was considered a violation of pure genetics. Ooh. <laughs> Yeesh. It kind of reminds me of the bill that they tried to pass in America about like interracial racial marriage, I think it was, that that state should be given authority on whether interracial marriage should be legal. And I'm, uh, I'm like, what are we living in the, the 16th century? How does this make, we're moving backwards. We keep moving backwards in progress because of these stupid racist beliefs. Like, why else would you think something like that if you weren't racist? Anybody that can think that way without like without like taking a step back first and being like, wait a minute, was that racist or was that a normal thing to say? <laughs> uh, it's just so weird and extreme and I don't understand it at all. Okay, I'm going to continue reading. <laughs> Media proliferated racist and colonialist, ideal, uh, colonialist ideals by pathologizing the black and brown body. Everybody loves dwarfs except Elf. <laughs> no! This is what we're trying to repent. No! <laughs> ah! <laughs> we were just 
talking about this before, how um, dwarves and like um, people of small stature are sort of like interpreted as like otherworldly beings and that they're, they're so closely tied to like the mythology that they're often harassed for it. No. <laughs> so sad. <laughs> no. No. No, we are not doing this. We are moving on. <laughs> Somebody quotes that the visible body gained the status of a text to be read only by scientists armed with various mechanical apparatuses were practiced in the search for some invisible inferiority. No, no. <laughs> okay. However, it is not solely scientific imagery that contributed to the reinforcement of racist ideals presented through the colonial game. Um, what do, you, what do you think about the no, no, stop it, you stop, right there, stop. What do you mean you can't help it? No, I'm not talking about like mythological dwarves. I'm not talking about dwarves in mythology or Lord of the Rings. I'm talking about people with the disease of dwarfism. <laughs> it is different. <laughs> It is very much different. Little people. Ah. <laughs> yes, you can't help it. Ah. <sighs> it was a good movie, though. It is a good movie. It is a very good movie. And dwarfism will forever be a part of human culture as a portion of mythology, and it will always be interpreted that way. I understand that. But in the context of people who have the condition of dwarfism, like it's it's not appropriate to compare them. But I understand if you have a love for Lord of the Rings and that's the first thing that comes to mind and you can't help it, you know, it is what it is. It'll it's it's fine. Yeah. I mean I technically live in Middle Earth, so you know it is what it is, but Okay. I'm gonna keep reading. Cool. <laughs> Uh, okay. Mm. Okay. Da, da, da. Coppola outlines, which is constituted through visual markers manifested in popular media and colloquial imagery, including examples of freak show performers who were, dis who were displayed for their racial otherness. The most prolific example of the racialized othered body was the hot and hot Venus, an African woman named Sarah Bartman, who was captured, sold into slavery, and then displayed in European freak shows with a focus on her curvy buttocks and, and large genitals. While it was argued that Bartman did not, was not necessarily portrayed as a pure representation of the black body, her abnormality was, was conceived as exotic and grotesque, and in many ways that reflects racist and disabledist beliefs. Even with the decline of overt scientific racism and eugenics, the focus on visual representation of race was created culturally specific categories for racialized bodies and institutional control of the gaze. Systematic oppression of both female racial bodies is also rooted in the visualization and imagery that be the natural or non inevitable similar to how non-inevitable non similarly to how the, the dwarf body has been created and deintegrated in deliberate ways. However, cell phone cameras have now have altered how visualization and images are generated and, dis and dis disseminated. Ah, the, the participants in this research project shared how unauthorized Picture taking occurs in direct relation to the centuries of visualized dwarf bodies ambient with modern twists before delving into the data generation within this research project on an overview of the research methods, the sensuality of the research that will be provided in the next section. Okay, I'm going to move on because this is just going through like an overview of what the article is going to be. Okay, part two, disability defined. The data used in this article 
were generated within the definition of disability illustrated through the social model of disability. The social model separates the experience of disability from the individual arguing that the external social and political and economic economic forces oppress people with physical, sensory, psychological, and intellectual impairments. The disabling experiences individuals encounter are rooted in these oppressive beliefs and structures that are not the result of any perceived defiancy. In the mind or body, Theorizations of this definition of disability were used that closely examine how cultural values and ideals have been woven into historical and economic structures of power leading to the deintegration and oppression of disabled people. Mm -hmm. The research analyzed in this paper was generated in 2013, 15, and 16. A total of 20 Six qualitative interviews were taken with people with dwarfism through telephone, email, and Skype video. Interviews were semi-structured when completed through telephone and Skype phone, while a series of open-ended questions were asked from the interviews. A focus group comprised of seven participants were also conducted during the Little People of America National Conference in St. Louis, America in 2015. Among money was invented to make possible weak men, strong men, a child, significant man, acknowledgement of men for a dwarf to control giants. Mm. It's an interesting quote, but mm. child of men, ignorant men. I mean, <laughs> No, it's more so much the other way around because it allows people who are already put in a position of power to oppress those who are below them. So I, I kind of disagree with that quote. Yeah, money does give you an edge up, but it's often obtained by people who already have power in the first place. Like how men are more like, who, have, who tend to have higher pay grades and like how old men are more likely to have money than children and like how people who suffer from dwarfism are less likely to obtain money than people of taller stature because they aren't discriminated against in the same way. So I, I kind of disagree with that quote. I don't know who made it, but I disagree with it. It's about people who are in power obtaining more power to have over people of lesser power. So I don't know, that's just my opinion on it. You could have, yeah, you probably have a different view from me. I'd be interested in hearing it, but that's just my take on the whole thing. Because when you think about money, people don't just suddenly have money. They must obtain it somehow. And a lot of people have difficulty in obtaining that sort of thing. Ah, oh, it's from Middle Earth. Ah, that makes sense. It isn't actually real. <laughs> it's not in the official context. Giants are literally giants. Yeah, I mean, I guess dwarfs, I guess in Middle Earth, if we're talking Middle Earth, they just have control over a lot of the minerals. So I guess they did have a lot of money. So I guess that does make sense. But children controlling old men? I don't know about that. Yeah, yeah, I guess that makes sense. Yeah, children would be controlling old men, though. Old men have more money than children do. Ah. <laughs> Foolish men to control wise men. Yeah, that's still like that's still prevalent in today's society. Actually, you don't necessarily have to be um, intelligent in certain fields in order to be, you know, in, have power over others, and that's quite interesting. Like for example, like um, recent political history, a child means a young king. Ah, that makes sense. Yeah, it, it kind of does. Yeah, I mean, old men as warriors. Ah. Right, I guess that makes sense. Yeah, a young pink king with little battle experience controlling those who have more experience and therefore be able to make better decisions than they would. Yeah, that's an interesting take to have. Sorry, I took the um the quote at face value thinking it was like, you know, in today's context in which it doesn't make a lot of sense, but 
Okay, thank you for clarifying. Much appreciated. Um, yeah, it's a very interesting quote. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, I guess money also allows for, like, people to universally communicate with other people in terms of, like, trade and that sort of thing. Because I think every culture or member of society will have different things at different values. So nothing will ever be consistent. But having something universal, which you're able to trade with other people, just gives you, like, a... Yeah, it gives you something in which you're able to communicate with others and be able to obtain things, or they are able to obtain things from you which they otherwise would find impossible. So money is both a good thing and a bad thing. I know the quote is that money's the root of all evil, and I guess in some degrees it is. But it also comes with, with its own benefits in society and that sort of thing. Sorry? Um... Hmm. Yeah, very interesting quote. I might continue on with the article. That's a bad word. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm going to keep reading. Um, I think I'll see the stop. Such as it near the top. Okay, I'm just going to continue on from here. Theorizations of this definition of disability so closely we use we use that closely examine how cultural values and ideals have been woven into, into historical and economic structures of power, leading to the, the de, of, de injuration and oppression of, of disabled people. Well, moving on. The research analyzed in this paper, da, 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 oh, I have read all this, good, good, okay. Um, while the participants shared a wide range of experiences in public places, the prevalence and gravity of unauthorized picture taking expressed by the participants demanded in-depth and detailed analysis. By positionality as a researcher with dwarfism allowed me to congens <laughs> complicated word. Ah, can't read. Cognizant. I'm gonna go with that. That's probably not how you pronounce it, but I'm gonna go with it. Allowed me to cognizant is the emotional and personal trauma of experiences of unauthorized picture taking. As an, as an individual who has experienced this phenomenon firsthand, I could relate to and understand the ways in which the discussions of these experiences were deeply personal and often gave rise to feelings of shame, low self-esteem, and anger. Okay. So the person who actually wrote this article also has dwarfism. That's very interesting. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's what gave them the inspiration to write it in the first place based on their own personal experience. Okay. Um, as a researcher, I was allowed to. Sh I was. <laughs> I was sure allowed to show the participants the close. The cho. No, the choice. Sorry, the choice to stop discussing an experience if they wanted to as well, as providing a space that allowed for the expressions of emotion, including anger and sadness. I found out that many participants were eager to discuss to discuss their experiences and frustrated that they were not acknowledged. So they were not more acknowledged of this issue. A few of them expressed relief in having the opportunity to express their emotions and perspectives around the experiences of unauthorized picture taking. Okay, so that's nice. Seeking participants. Okay. The rarity of impairments that, that cause profound short stature made make people with dwarfism a geographically dispersed population. However, for over 50 years, people with dwarfism have been joining together form groups and associations. These associations, such as Little People of America, Little People of Canada, and the Restricted Growth Association promote equal rights for people with dwarfism, provide support for members, and advocate for education and awareness. Alongside these organizations, a proliferation of social networking sites, there are many people with dwarfism connected to to connect it to talk about specific issues relating to their social and personal experiences. Participants were recruited through these social networking sites. Being a person with dwarfism was essentially, was essential to gaining access to those, to these groups and many, and my inclusion in this community was invaluable to this regard. The global dispersion of participants allowed a, div a diverse range of nationalities to be included in this research, 
However, the most participants were either from the United Kingdom or the United States. All research was, was conducted according to the ethical guidelines of the University of Leeds and participants' identities were anonymized. An interpretive methodology was used to encode and analyze the data. Okay, I'm gonna be skipping this part because it's sort of based on like how they recorded the data and such. Okay, part three, unauthorized picture taking, a modern gaze of dwarf bodies. Discussions of the experience of unauthorized picture taking became a significant topic of discussion in both interviews and in the focus group with data revealing over half of the participants encountered this, this behavior firsthand. Each circumstance was unique with these experiences. However, there was a consensus that it was one of the most violating and unsettling encounters that they had in public spaces. Participants' perspectives and insights surrounding this phenomenon were insightful, informative, and provided a guide upon which to, investi to, uh, to investigate and analyze. Okay. That's, that's a very short paragraph. Okay. The, the next paragraph is called Modern Freak Show, Camera Phones and the Dwarf Body. Many of the participants linked the concept of dwarf body and its association with humor and novelty to their experience of unauthorized picture taking. Anna, aged 27, lived in Amsterdam and shared an unsettling incident that occurred when she was with her boyfriend who also has dwarfism. They were casually walking down the street. A guy jumped out of his car, who was so happy to see us, would like to take a picture from us. When I told him that it was not okay, he laughed more and more and took lots of pictures, then he drove away. It was something we did not like. She believed that being with another person with the wars with the wars I can't speak, I need to drink water. Ah <laughs> I can't speak. Ah Okay. <sighs> She believed that being with another person with dwarfism exacerbated the ways their bodies were connected to human otherness. She declared that it was the most extreme situation I could remember. Anna was curious to know what the individual planned to do with the photograph and admitted to feeling a bit concerned about it. It could have ended up on the internet without her consent. Unfortunately, Anna's Fears were not unfounded, as several of the participants reported their findings, either their friends or their own photographs, from either their friends or their own photographs online without their approval. Sometimes used in horrifically dehumanizing internet memes, where a picture was captured in mocking tones. These images were either stolen from face from their Facebook pages or taken from them without their knowledge. This phenomenon can be analyzed as an extension of the freak show of the 19th century, where dwarf bodies were utilized as amusing, and sh amusing, humorous, and deserving of ridicule. Deborah, aged 41, experienced this firsthand when a video of her dancing at a bar was taken, surreptitiously, wound up to be circulated by, wound up being circulated among members of the community she lived in, a small town in the southern United States. She got her first scooter and she uses that she uses to navigate public spaces to a, to dance at a local bar. Deborah recounts how she heard about the video. My fiance yeah, fiance. My fiance at work and one of his friends comes up to him and says, Oh my friend showed me a video of your fiance the other night. He was like, What? That video, you know, that video, you know, it is a small town. It got around. The internet... <laughs> Ugh, that was terribly written. <laughs> ah, that was so hard to read. Okay. <sighs> Continuing to read. Okay. The interest in documenting people with dwarfism denotes a desire for prolonged gaze beyond an initial stare. The message behind this gaze was clear. The wolf the dwarf body is abnormal, freakish, and reserved for the amusement of non-dwarfs. Some of the participants also feel the, no, that the knowledge of the public, many people with dwarfism actively engage in entertainment roles, justifies treating a stranger with dwarfism as being on display. They cited instances where people with dwarfism are hired to attend parties to act as novelties for the guests. 
and is directly related to be perceived as other as objects to be recorded for amusement. Alison, age 63, expressed frustration with these roles and those chose to take them on, and those that chose to take them on. But what do we see on the media? Freaks, these damn people who play those parts and ridicule our people. I mean, I have no patience for it. I mean, years ago when these things were tough, things were tougher, but we can get educated and jobs and all of that. Okay, so this is coming from an older person who has had, like, who has his experiences for their entire life, and they're saying that while progress is being made in the way that they have, you know, rights now, they're able to get jobs and that sort of thing, there's still public humiliation in the, in this case with this article, in the form of um, unauthorized picture taking and being ridiculed publicly. And they're expected to be entertainment. The effect of these roles represent and representations have on the daily lives of people with dwarfism is a hotly debated issue among people with dwarfism. While some of the participants agree with Alison's view, others felt that such roles, including cosplay or panto, can involve dressing up as an elf or baby was a question of individual choice and should not be restricted based on correlation with interpersonal discrimination or negative interactions. Becky, age 27, a Londoner, recounted several experiences where she had a picture taken with her boyfriend who also had dwarfism. She questions the beliefs behind the act and the repercussions for those who experience it. I think we had a businessman do it once on a train. What kind of friends do you have where they're going? What kind of friends do you have where they're going to think this is funny or clever? Do you want to Google someone with dwarfism? Go do it. You don't need to take a picture of me. It is invasive and very upsetting. You go around thinking I'm a normal person doing normal things on the train to work or whatever, and then you, and then it is just the sort of or whatever, and then it just sort of brings you down to, oh no, I am not, which is hurtful. Ah, sorry, the quotes are very hard to read sometimes because they're transcribed directly, and sometimes reading people's like, write like their um their writing language is differently. Sorry, there. How people like directly quote others sometimes with they're just normal people, you get like the short of like the add on bits like light or like or I mean or that sort of thing repeatedly added in and it's written very inefficiently and it's hard to read and ah. Okay. I'm gonna continue reading. The kid communicated a feeling of being dehumanized where her internal where her external identity is synonymous with her objectified body, disregarding all other aspects of her humanity. She felt it was the worst thing that happened in her daily encounters, that it had been more frequent with the use of cell phones because people didn't have because people didn't used to have the option. I'm sorry, there are not people outside. Okay. That's sorted out. Um Good Lord. Okay. I'm going to stop for a little bit because people are being loud outside. I'm just going to wait until that passes. Okay, cool. Nikki mm. suggested that while she, while she always felt a gaze on her body, the use of cell phone camera was altered to how she experienced it. Picture taking extends the stare indefinitely. Marjorie, aged 48, felt that on us, the unauthorized picture taking is an extension of the stare as well. She could describe it in detail, the various stares that she encounters with picture taking on the extreme end. From long drawn out following with the eyes with open mouth, the serendipitous side glances, Amongst a peekaboo style, the dreaded picture taking with their camera phone, Marjorie displayed an, ex an expert sense for deciphering what type of stare she was encountering, a necessary mechanism to manage interpersonal interactions with public spaces. Shakespeare 
Thompson and Wright in their research with people with dwarfism found that they had a sixth sense for, people, for someone in the pub pointing at them out to a companion. The skill demonstrates not only heightened perceptions in public spaces, but also awareness that their bodies are unexpected and as a result under constant surveillance. Sorry. <sighs> okay. For a number of the participants, the experience of an unauthorized picture taking reflected in specific views of their bodies and social and cultural beliefs that, they're, that they are for public display. Kate, age 27, argued that the rationale of people of the picture taker reflects this view. And she stated, I think subconsciously they think, oh, it's fine, they don't mind. They're not going to fight back if you take a photo. And we can just treat people with restricted growth in the way that we feel is right. Why people with dwarfism experience this behavior requires a closer look at the gene gene genealogical origins of the subject, which includes an illustration pre previously their cultural representations in primarily voyeur voyeuristic avenue. Elizabeth, age 38, reiterates this view, arguing that people with dwarfism are still viewed as other beings and thus encountered with them as documented accordingly. And thus encounters with them are documented accordingly. Okay. In, in general, I think most people view individuals of short stature to be otherly, especially to those that do not know them, that do not know someone with dwarfism. I believe that we are viewed as the last group, that it's okay to snicker at, to take photos of, to video, as though they've spotted some unknown creature. The perspective of the participants that they are, that they are, that, that they were being considered other than human reflects on how photography has been used historically as a tool to exploit and degenerate disabled people with dwarfism. Okay, the next paragraph is called the history of the photographic gaze. It has been explored most notably by, Bog by Bogdan, Elks, and Knoll in the Garland Thompson, and Garland Thompson, sorry. Our photography has been used to objectify and pathologize disabled, pe disabled people, disabled people, including people with dwarfism, perpetuating negative characterizations of differently shaped or moving bodies, especially during the Victorian era freak show. And the eugenics movement of the 19th and 20th century. Photographic, photographic documentation of individuals with a variety of impairments supported the idea that visualization of impairment was primary to identifying and classifying those with considerable of those who are considered undesirable, sorry. In conjunction, photographs were also used as an integral part of the exploitation of people with dwarfism, who were involved in freak shows, where photographs are designated as both a keepsake and as an advertisement to view freak bodies. Viewing, a disabled, viewing disabled people in freak shows was a deliberate force of dehumanization, as, Sh as Shakespeare argues. The, <laughs> the freak show is an example of the way that human beings are seen as non-human as potential exhibits in what was perhaps a cross between a human, between a zoo and a museum. The height of eugenics movement at the turn of the 19th century utilized photographic documentation of individuals with a variety of impairments. To support the idea of visualization of impairment was the primary to identifying and classifying undesirable traits. Often the focus was on those with intellectual or learning impairments. Classifying them according to their facial features, which proved their degeneracy and thus the need for generic purity. Bogdan, Elks, and Noll identify a number of ways in which people with dwarfism are depicted in photographs, including the term a cretin, which is used for a person with inter intellectual impairment is the result of hypothyroidism, which has made their bodies abnormally small. They outline how dwarfs are photographed next to tall people, even
even giant, a juxtaposition designed to make dwarf people seem even shorter. The giants seem taller, and the giants seem taller. The use of visual imagery came at a time of increasing ocular-centric shift linked to the modernity where the natural elimination of deviations are valorized. The increase was a part due to the invention of the use of the photography that, where the general public could be given examples of the other body. Garvin Tolman argues that photography has enabled the social ritual of staring at disability to persist in an alternate form. These images and their occupying captions and analysis were manipulated and distorted at the same time. They were used as an absolute proof, not only of the deficiency of the disabled body, but also of other abnormal bodies. The participants expressed the experience of an unauthorized... Oh, hello, what is, what is this book about? <laughs> Sorry, I missed your comment. Uh, um, it's an article on... Um, people with dwarfism and their um, experiences of being photographed and that sort of thing, as well as like the history of it and why it exists and that sort of thing. <sighs> Sorry, <laughs> I didn't see your comments. I was too busy reading. <laughs> okay. I'm going to continue to read. It's not a book, it's, a, it's an academic article, but yeah. I hope you enjoyed them both. Oh, that's okay. I only just commented. That's good. I thought I'd like left you waiting for minutes. Ah. <sighs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah, it's an article on dwarfism and the history of it and people's experiences with it and that sort of thing. Okay. I will continue reading. Okay. These images. Ah. All right. Okay. Is this about dwarfism? Yeah, it is about dwarfism. Yep, and feel free to ask any questions about it, about what I'm reading, or if you have any comments or anything that you want to make. It's, it's open for discussion. I mean, this, is, this isn't the just chatting section. It's for discussion. If you want to say anything about the article, even about anything else, feel free to just spit for. Okay. These images and the accompanying captions and analysis were manipulated and distorted at the same time as they were used as, as absolute proof of not only the deficiency, defiancy? defiancy of the disabled body, but also of other abnormal bodies. The participants expressed the experience of unauthorized. Uh, from the title, I thought you were reading a book about broken hearts or something. Uh, and so I was interested. Ah, uh, I see. Maybe I should edit my title. Um, it's an academic reading. Hence the end of the title. And I'm going through, I went through one earlier that was called Healing the Heart of Recovery. That was about um, mental illness and that sort of thing. And how, um, and how people compare their experiences of, you know, being in a safe place in their own social environment compared to a clinical setting and their journey to healing and that sort of thing. Maybe I should like, yeah, maybe I should change my title so that people don't get confused. Um, okay. Da -da 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 -da. Mm. Title of this article is, um, oh, all right. Picture taking of people with dwarfism in public spaces. Okay, done. Nice. It's been updated. What insight did you gain from that earlier reading? Oh. Sorry. Hello. Are you on Zoom? I'm doing a live stream. Yeah. Oh nice. Okay. It was just noise. Mm. Okay. Cool. Have a good night. <laughs> okay. Um. What insight did I gain from reading that? Um. Yeah. Essentially, that um. That healing is a journey, essentially, and that um. 
Yeah, and that you should learn to recover in rather than recover from illness, particularly with mental illness, because it comes with, um, because recovery from comes with the idea of just curing, where like you recover from everything and you're back to the way that you were before, rather than learning to understand and um, live with what with the condition that you have, which um, which is much which is better for you know personal growth and that sort of thing. So it was very interesting in the way that people shared their own personal experiences with growth in a clinical setting, and how um, health shouldn't be viewed from a cure from a cure-all perspective. That we should all focus on restitutional type stories and that sort of thing. It's more on the journey that you go on, and being able to learn from your experiences and that sort of thing. Yeah, it was good insight. It was very interesting. Yeah, and this one is more to do with um, discrimination and stuff which people with, you know, different bodies experience. Yeah, okay. Well, feel free to stick around if this interests you as well, but I understand. Living with mental illness is the right idea rather than a complete change, yet. But I do think we should strive to move past mental illnesses eventually. Well, for a lot of people, it's, and that's not something that they can move past, like, for example, Something where someone with PTSD might have that trauma for the rest of their life, and I don't, I don't really blame them for that. Of course, it's something that we should always um, strive to improve our, our coping this with. It's something that we have to live and understand. But um, a lot of the time, it isn't possible for people to entirely recover. It, it comes with the idea that we think that everything is curable and we can get over it eventually. But for that's not the case for a lot of people, especially with um with illnesses that are like have changed the, the very structure of their own brains and that sort of thing. It's not something that most people can help. Um, especially if it's um, not even a mental illness, but something just to do with um, neurodiversity. Uh, yeah, I mean, you could look into methods of helping people who have trauma, but yeah, a lot of the virtual reality, for example, is a new form of therapy. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good idea, being able to use um, virtual reality to help people with that sort of thing. Um, it sort of reminds me of people who, um, there was a study that was done on people who took um, small uh, tabs of uh, magic mushrooms, so hallucinogenic drugs, and they were given to people who were diagnosed with terminal illnesses. And it really helped them to gain a better perception and understanding of it, and it allowed them to have better acceptance with less anxiety surrounding it. So, yeah, that was a very interesting study done by people in a more modern setting. Um, your virtual reality is a good idea. I don't, a lot of the time you can't really cure people's trauma. It's, it's, um, it results in differences in somebody's brain and how they view things. I don't think trauma is something that you can entirely cure. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's all about being happy, but sometimes incorporating your trauma into yourself isn't necessarily a bad thing either. It's something that you can learn from. It's something that becomes a part of you. Your struggles are a part of you as much as it's sad and everything. Your struggles aren't you, but they will always be with you, no matter how traumatic they are. We've all experienced something terrible in the way that in our lives and that sort of thing. Yeah, incorporating trauma. It's something that, like for example, if you experience like sexual trauma or something like that, you become more aware of your surroundings. Of course, being hyper aware is something that people also experience, but you're also able to bring awareness to the trauma that people experience because completely trauming is like um, curing yourself of it. You're like, yep, I don't feel about it anymore. I don't care about it. It happened in the past, it's fine. But, um. Completely moving past it and ignoring what you experienced also it doesn't it means that it's hard for you to advocate for people who have also experienced the same thing. The trauma allows you to advocate for others who have gone through the same thing and might not be at the same level of acceptance as you. So it's it's really good for being able to help others who are going through a similar prospect. Um, yeah, being able to live with them, being able to live with it. Yeah, it's it is a very interesting topic. As much as um, like for example, I was um, I was going, I was doing research into like different stories that people conveyed with their trauma and their struggles and illness and that sort of thing, and we often came across. I'm gonna say three. There were four main types, but like three of them are kind of relevant to the conversation. The first one is called a restitutional story, 
which is a story in which, you know, yesterday I was sick, I was normal, I was completely healthy. Today I am sick, I am ill, but tomorrow I'll be healthy again. That's a restitutional story. And while it's something, it's something that we all want to strive for, it's something that we all want to have, it's something that, yo, I had a struggle, but I got over it, and I'm great now. That's sort of the thing that we want to experience, and it's the thing that we often look for. Like, whenever we see, oh, yeah, this person was saved, and its progress is great now, it's doing so well. It doesn't even have a hint of what it was, of what it was like when it was sick. Or, wow, this person was magically cured. They used to they, their arm was unwillingly amputated by a shark, but it's magically grown back now. Wow, is that the same way it was before? And that's what a restitutional story is. It's a story of curing, which doesn't take into account personal growth or chronic illness or permanent illnesses. It focuses solely on, like, um, on short-term illnesses or cure-all sort of interpretations of illness and that where things can be cured sensibly, yeah. Marcus like, like exactly that's a very good analogy to have you don't there's no lingering shadows in the in the light when you come out the other side it's all it's like oh it's back to the way it was before it's fine I'm doing well it's, it's all about that in comparison to example a chaos story which people describe as a whirlpool where they get sucked in where bad things just keep on happening to them and they can't pull themselves out of the mental state of oh this happened and this happened and this happened it keeps getting worse and worse and worse and worse so instead of like like darkness like darkness it's just darkness and they're stuck in it that's how you describe chaos and no matter how many how people try to like pull them out of it they're stuck in this sort of state of down spiral that's what a chaos story is and chaos stories, while they show the reality of suffering and struggling, they also don't take into account personal growth and healing. They don't take into account the small strides that we take in moving towards recovery. They only take into account the struggle and the injury and the pain and the suffering. Whereas like the last type of story that I'm going to mention is called a quest story. We have somebody who is viewed as the protagonist, the hero in their own story, where they're going through a struggle and they take on take it on like a journey. And they move through it and it's all about self discovery and and conveying their findings to the people who have similar struggles in the general public. They're like, Oh, this is what happened, I'm growing from it, yeah, this is everything that happened, I'm overcoming. That was it's a story of overcoming. And the thing about quest stories is that they're great generally. Like when you think of it, it's like, oh yeah, that sounds like a great definition of health. But then you think about the qualities that it lacks. For example, a chaos story, it doesn't convey the amount of suffering that a person is feeling. It only interprets the overcoming, like I am strong, I am overcoming, I'm a hero. It doesn't take into account the amount of suffering that the person is feeling when they are in darkness. So all of them are flawed ways or stories of perceiving illness. There's no one good way to do it, but it's sort of the main way that general people convey their illness and how they interpret it. Yeah, it's like life in a staircase. Exactly, it's all about the process. So I think the best way that we can describe illness and the journeys that we take through life and health and illness, yeah, it can be described like a staircase. Sometimes you go up, you go down, Sometimes you stay in the same spot for a while before going up or down again. Or like using a mixture of stories. Like, for example, at some point in your life, yeah, you will be going through a chaos story where stuff just keeps getting worse. Yeah, there will be periods of time where you have a cold or something and you're sick for a week, but then, oh, you're better the next week and you're perfectly fine again. Or even a journey where, like, you go through something like addiction, like where, where you're suffering from alcoholism. And you want to go through your recovery of that and express it to other people with the same struggles in the general public about what it's like to go through those sorts of chronic issues. It's, um, it's a myriad of interpretations that happen throughout your life. All of them are flawed as like one standard way of interpreting, of like interpreting health. All of them have their strengths and weaknesses. And it's about having a mixture of them because not one of us fits into those, like a singular category. So, yeah, it's all about being able to express things in the form of journeying and a mixture of different types of stories. Yeah, you've got very nice analogies. You could think of life as a staircase, but 
it's not necessarily, we're not always making progress. Sometimes we just got to sit there and wait a while before something happens. Sometimes we, we strive on up. Sometimes it's really hard to move forward. We still continue to do so. And sometimes we fall down the stairs and it's horrible. But we eventually get back up again and we keep going. And that's just sort of how it is. Okay. <sighs> Thank you. That was a very fruitful discussion. Okay. Nice. I'm going to... Yeah, I think I'll continue reading and you can comment on it because I think this is also a very interesting thing. Yeah, yeah, it's a very interesting circumstance as well because when you think about illness, some people, yeah, it was very enjoyable, thank you. But um, if you think about people with dwarfism, for example, which is like the article which I'm reading about right now, you could think of them as like a person that is like when placed on the stairs of life, in a place in which they are more susceptible to falling because they are they are placed with a, with additional challenges which people who are of a regular size wouldn't experience like for example they could be discriminated against unnecessarily or in the case of this article you know they get pictures taken of them it makes them anxious it's hard, harder for them to get work and that sort of thing it just gets more and more difficult for them because of these additional challenges. But they form communities and they rally around it to educate people about what it's like to be in the condition that they're in, in the hopes that people in the generations to come who have a similar condition won't have it as hard off as them. And they have made significant improvements in that category, but this article is about how it isn't quite at the stage where they want it to be and that they want to continue to make improvements for it to be a more livable environment for people with the condition. Hmm. Da -da -da. Should be, yeah, it's definitely. I mean, if we, I think most religions that eat, like a lot of societal structures are focused around helping people and charity and being able to give everything that you have to others. But yeah, I mean, if you think about it, yeah, there's a lot of different societal structures. You can think about like religion and that sort of thing. You could think about even economic structures like communism versus capitalism versus socialism. It's all different ideologies. Like, for example, capitalism takes on the ideology like, oh, you have to work for your money, but define what level of work, you know, what, what capacity of work are you looking for? What, what do you think is like a good definition of hard work because some people aren't capable of performing to the same level of others for conditions that are outside of their own control and sometimes it's just they just can't help it because yeah socialism yeah, versus capitalism yeah socialism is like yeah I live in a socialist capitalist country because they live in New Zealand so while we have like taxation and like capitalism in terms of like our business style and that sort of thing we still have quite a high level of like beneficiaries and being able to like give to people and taxation and yeah yeah it's a very interesting environment to live in but like I've never understand the ideology of like oh they're useless to society anyway why give them money <laughs> they're not contributing anything it's like who cares you have children they contribute nothing as well and we, we still support them because we want them to grow and have a good quality of life uh social democracy yes we are I think I don't know our exact definition, but I know that we have elements of socialism in our um in our general social structure, but it's mostly capitalist democracy. Yeah. I mean we are a democracy and we have elements of both capitalism and socialism within our structure, yeah. <sighs> yeah, it's fun. <laughs> yeah, just it's just so cruel. Yeah. It is, it is interesting. It's just so cruel to think of things in, in the capacity of, oh, if they can't work to earn it, then they shouldn't have it. Like, really? Like, <laughs> it's just so stupid. I've never understood. <sighs> okay. Uh, I've still got quite a few pages to go, so I'm going to attempt to make progress in this. The next section might be a bit triggering for people who are sensitive to this kind of thing because it's called hostile encounters 
So it's about experiences which people of dwarfism have felt, you know, um, in terms of, you know, their picture being taken, about being harassed in public and that sort of thing. So I'm going to read through that. <laughs> no, it's okay. I love the discussions and that sort of thing. But I do have to get through this. I've been streaming for four hours. Four hours. This is the longest I've gone on for. <laughs> I need to get through the article. Ah, <laughs> but I, I love talking about this kind of thing at the same time. It's not as fun if I'm just reading aloud to a silent audience, you know? Okay, hostile encounters. Some of the experiences of unauthorized picture taking were more urgurous than others. For a few, the act situated in blatantly abusive attitudes and language and was deliberate attempt to dehumanize them. Kate, age 31, recounts an unsettling experience that escalated when she was traveling in New York City. There was this group of teenagers that were trying to take a picture of me. My friends stopped them. She put her hand in front of their mobile because one of their friends was in, one of the girls was embarrassed and started, they started calling midget, midget, come here, midget, come suck my cock, midget. And they were demanding, come here now, midget. And I just kept walking because, oh my God, a group of teenagers. It was a big group of teenagers. I just had to keep walking. Kate's encounter not only revealed that she was dehumanized, but also reflects how some women with the wolfism are fetishized and sexualized and was referenced in what was referenced previously in this article. Patricia, aged 44, also had an experience that combined the use of midget, a term that is deeply offensive to a large majority of people's dwarfism, and the act of taking a picture. A few years ago, I was walking down the street and someone drove past in a white van and leant out the window in yelled midget and took a picture of me. And I found that very disconcerting. In Patricia's experience, there was no attempt to hide the fact of picture taking and instead the individual wanted to make sure that she felt objectified. Karen, aged 43, expressed anger and outrage recounting the experiences but she not, but not only she was, but not only, sorry, it's a very, poorly Christian sentence, experiences where not only she, but also her young daughter, who is dwarfism, was photographed without their consent. It is really disturbing when people's, people, especially, it's really disturbing with the photos, especially when you are taking them in front of the kids, in front of my kids, because I could not imagine a situation where I photo photographed some, one, someone else's child without knowing the child or talking to the parents. The worst that it, the worst was that it was, the worst was that it really frightens my daughter. She has become just terrified. Like, why are they photographing me? And especially when they are following you around. Yeah, I mean, it's all about. Hmm. Well, humans are generally afraid of like the topic of unknown. We have um. Curiosity, for one, and two, a fear of things that we don't understand. And so when you combine the two, you get people that fear things which are different from them, and yet they want to analyze them and understand them in their own way. So they'll take something that they don't understand and be like, oh, this is different from me. It must be a bad thing, but I also want to know what it is. And so they'll, like just, they'll hyperanalyze it and make assumption after assumption about it and and amplify it to the extent where it's just ridiculous and stupid assumptions and language is made. An entire culture is made around discriminating against these people because they don't view them as people. They view them as objects. Yeah, like, um, <laughs> I don't know which country you are from, but I know that in America, um, the whole topic of like how um, black people were depicted back in the old days and how they were like, portrayed with excessively dark skin and really large lips. And that's just how they were depicted in all media in a very cartoonish manner. UK, okay. Yeah, so, but it, it, you think I know what I'm talking about. They don't actually look that way. Those types of features were accentuated to the point where they were like, oh, this is what we stereotypically think they look like because they're just exacerbating certain aspects of them which creates an image which is completely untrue of them. In the same way that we make image of them, images of them that are untrue, we make general assumptions about the people that they are, despite not knowing them, because we view them as a phenomenon and not 
people with thoughts and emotions and feelings and cultures. We view them as, as others. We don't view them as people. I think it's a positive. Feel superior to others. Yeah, definitely. There's definitely an inferiority component to it. There are definitely people who are like, oh, I'm taller than you, therefore you are lesser than I am. All that sort of thing. And especially, it's very interesting with people who um who have the condition of dwarfism because they're often interpreted in mythology with certain connotations. So those connotations are placed on them as well, as well as the fact that they're often like placed in you know society as like um in the in the media in general as like oh they're um comic relief or they're they're funny to look at or they make funny jokes haha or they're viewed as pets, or they're fetishized, and all these sort of more modern interpretations of them in combination with their mythological, like, roots, you know, such as, like, leprechauns and, like, dwarfs in the Middle Earth sort of sense of it. So they're conflicted on all sides with all these assumptions on them because they look different and therefore aren't viewed as human. Yeah, it's not great. <laughs> Definitely isn't, but that's why we write stuff about it and try to make people understand like even in space culture like you see um memes and stuff of people that are of that are of shorter stature and they're made fun of a lot even with even when their videos aren't made with the intention of comedy they're turned into comedy because people view people who are dwarfism as inherently as, as a joke they are viewed as jokes because of their existence even if they're making something without the intent of it being comedy, people still make fun of them because they view their existence as a joke. It's not the actions that they make, it's not their intention, but it's because of the way that they exist. It's not something which is, you know, normalized. <sighs> yeah, it's not fun. Definitely not, especially with experiences like this, because it's, it's all well and good to hide behind a screen and laugh at and someone with dwarfism on the internet and like can, like making jokes about how small they are or how light they are and that sort of thing. But going up to somebody in public with dwarfism, ridiculing them and taking pictures of them, it's just, no, it's not on. It's, it's horrible. Okay. I'm going to continue to read. Yo. The participants asserted that unauthorized pictures were taken in public spaces was offensive, dehumanizing, and violating. Although their experiences were specific and occurred within varying contexts, they believed it was a result of distinct, culturally specific, oppressive views on their body. The impact of socio-historical roles in the representation of the dwarf body are significant Trump contributors to, the, to, their part, to these participants' experiences in interpersonal discrimination. However, unauthorized picture taking reveals a new twist on tradition, ways the gaze is maintained and, ex and experienced by bodies considered abnormal. This requires further analysis incorporated on how so cell phone cameras have alterate, al alterated, altered how the gaze on dwarf bodies is experienced. Yeah, this just really needs to change in order to improve. Race and discrimination, how can we change the system? What can we do better, I wonder? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's something that we can change immediately on a societal level because it's so ingrained culturally, especially since, like, before I talked about the whole, it's based in mythology. This type of <laughs> discrimination goes back to, like, humanity's, in, like, renaissance to its birth, essentially. It's it goes way back to its like fucking antiquity, mate. It goes back for a while. So undoing all of those um those understand like the stereotypes of people with dwarfism is gonna take a very long time. Especially since people joke and discrimination have have discrimination like discriminatory comments made towards them in today's society and they just they're viewed as like as comedy pieces <laughs> and it's not great. Mm. Yeah, I don't think there are many, I don't think there are many, if any, systems which specifically support people with dwarfism to a good extent. I don't think, yeah, 
it's something that we're just going to have to slowly improve on as a society because you're always going to have people which are brought up with the assumption that people with dwarfism are just inherently co- pieces of comedy for them to gawk and laugh at. So, yeah, it'll take a while, but yeah, hopefully we can slowly improve to the point where it's less noticeable. Okay. The next paragraph is called Four Colts Looking Glass, Unauthorized Picture Taking as a Panathicon. I've struggled with this word this entire time to keep repeating it. Pano Panop Panopticon. Panopticon, okay. Sorry. Forecast serialization of Ben Sam's Panopticon. Panopticon. <laughs> Panopticon. <laughs> Panopticon. Okay, so a Panopticon is a hyper surveillance design of a prison complex. Ah, okay. Has been used as a way to explore the effect of achieved the effect achieved through the realization that one is subject to the gaze is a fruitful concept when analyzing unauthorized picture taking. For people with dwarfism, the awareness of that social encounters involving the visualization of their body lead to staring experiences that and potentially photographs. Shifts these experiences from interpersonal to general encompassing social gaze. It exerts both power that exerts its power both during these encounters and outside of them. <laughs> the participants express that they are often aware that bodies were subjected to scrutiny and objectification when they left their home. For some of them this resulted in a regulatory measure that guided their encounters with other actors in public. Vicky, age twenty seven, shared that her boyfriend who also has dwarfs them is often trying to trying to ascertain whether he is being recorded, resulting in leaving them on edge. I think they know <laughs> They think you don't notice. I don't really observe it that much. But if I'm with my boyfriend, she will watch people with their cameras at funny angles. Sometimes they are taking a picture, and sometimes they haven't, and it's difficult because it makes you a bit on edge and paranoid about it. The gaze they experience reaches the experience which is far beyond a second glance in a public space. It can be permanent into how they interact. Permeate. That can permeate, sorry. It can permeate into how they interact and what they do in public spaces. This effect results in a continual reminder for people with the dwarfism that they are considered freaks and that their bodies not only notice, that are not only noticeably different, but can be objectified without their knowledge or consent. Matheson applies Walcott's interpretation that, panopticon, that the panopticon represents how few people see the many to the increasing proliferation of mass communication technologies, proposing instead that society has become synoptical where they see the few. Matheson argues that the decentralized, narrow, orientated panopticons may quickly be combined into large, broad-ranging systems by simple techno- technological and technoglo- yeah. technological devices. Ah, I'm losing my, my speech. <laughs> it takes photographs. Who takes photographs and the meaning behind the picture taking is varied throughout history. The advent of the cell phone camera in the 21st century and the perpetual barrage of photographs shared through social media have altered how images are taken and proliferated. As outlined previously, the internet provides a place for voyeurs, for voyeurs of differently shaped bodies to gaze unencumbered, unencumbered, I've never heard that word before, In, unencumbered, okay, by social norms or ethical considerations of body, bodily autonomy and respect. No longer are photographs predominantly in the domain of the professional photographer or scientist, While in infancy, social research has been looking into how cell phone cameras influence the interactions in the social media world, as well as how attitudes towards photography have altered. While an in-depth analysis of issues are brought up by by their use is not possible here, 
Several elements prove useful when looking at an unauthorized picture taking. Un <laughs> yes, yes, I didn't. It's like it's, I think it's un in cucumber. Yeah, un in cucumber, like with a like an n after the e. But yeah, I've I've never heard that word before. And I'm not entirely sure what it means. But I'm gonna move on anyway. <laughs> so, yeah, it's all good. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna continue reading. Well, although there has been a shift as to who has the power to record and document other bodies, the underlying ideologies have remained, and as illustrated, the phone camera is used in similar ways that in institutionally control images. Unincumbent means like not holding on to something, not holding something. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's such a weird word. Oh yeah, okay, that makes sense. Uh unencumbered? Unencumbered? Unencumbered, I'm guessing what it means. Yeah, unencumbered. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. It kind of makes a little more sense. Thank you for the clarification. I probably wasn't ever going to look that up. Okay. <sighs> Moving on. Okay. There has been a shift as to who has the power to record and document other bodies. The underlying ideology has uh, the underlying ideologies have remained and as illustrated the phone camera is used in a similar way similar way that institutionally controlled images were in the past. However, because of the visualization of other bodies have been disguised as an organic reaction to abnormality, there is a little realization of social and cultural forces that determine the... Because um, if you ever heard of being unencumbered in regards to a game... At least I think so. No, I've never heard that to unencumbered. Uh, not to my knowledge have I ever come across that word before, or at least maybe I've heard it, or maybe I've never seen it being written down before, and so it's putting me off. It just looks so strange when you when you write it down, I don't know. You know, I can't say I've heard it before, or maybe I have and I simply don't remember, but it is what it is. Okay. Um, Shakespeare, not, not William, just some other Shakespeare. <laughs> outlines how phone camera abuse isn't inevitable. It is not natural to stare at people who look different. It's a cultural choice. In this case, facilitated by technology's advance. Okay. The ease by which a photograph is taken with a cell phone and the capacity for a cell phone to hold thousands of pictures opens the door to frequent picture taking. Billy finds that the use of camera phone cameras, <laughs> camera, cell phone cameras, and the instant ability to share your photographs digitally. Really, I'm not Shakespeare. <laughs> no, it is Shakespeare. It's just Shakespeare, not William Shakespeare. It's just a person who happens to also have the last name of Shakespeare. Okay, nice. <laughs> I've seen it being referenced in a lot of different, um, in a lot of different academic articles. <laughs> I must get that a lot. I feel so sorry for him. <laughs> oh, poor guy. Okay, moving on. Where was I? Instant ability to share a photograph dig digitally with others has changed photography into the recording, which is transient, mundane, and interpersonal. Our photographs are used to document our lives in the present moment and the flow of everyday life. The encounter. On most photographs are harmless visually interesting things, a blooming, a blooming tree, a cute pet. These images also capture a previously unseen social behavior. So it is Shakespeare, but not William. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because um, people in like in academic literature are normally just quoted with their last name. So it's just their last name and you move on from that. So this guy just happens to have the last name Shakespeare. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, 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 not William, They're just Shakespeare, just Shakespeare, okay, um, okay, that's where I am, okay, cool, 
Stellis and Horner reimagined the cell phone camera as a portable pano- panopticon, sorry, where the power of surveillance is dispersed to the average citizen, bringing about complex dynamics dynamics between traditional institutional surveillance power and the power of the gaze, which operates in interpersonal interactions. In this way, cell phone cameras have been seen to be inducing a new kind of voyeurism. Uh, I want to know about your academic journey. Oh, no, it's okay. I can answer them now. It's, it's relatively quick. Um, I'm currently taking a course in the population health, which is like a more ethical and you know, societal focus on health and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, I've only really just started streaming. This is like my fifth stream. I often stream like academic readings, which are provided to me by the course that I'm taking or ones that I find on my own. And I read them generally. I also read novels and that sort of thing. I'm sort of interested in, yeah. Ethics and morality is a very complex and interesting subject. Yeah, and it's, it's very interesting how we can advance it. Yeah, provide to the people around us. I generally just sort of started this channel to help with reading, so being able to like pass on knowledge, because I know there are a lot of people that would be interested in the topics which are discussed in a lot of literature, but it, it isn't able to be conveyed in a way that they're able to consume it because um, people either dislike reading novels or they don't read academic literature or anything like that. So they receive all of their academic stuff from either the people around them or videos on YouTube or the news or something, which can often be quite biased and isn't at the heart of research and that sort of thing. They often take snippets and and the entertaining prospects of it. Yeah, that's great. I know there are a lot of people like like you who are very curious about general like everyday life and that sort of thing and I want to be able to convey a medium which is often hard to access for a lot of people who either have difficulty reading or they find the challenge like um to to be too broad or too difficult for them because they put themselves down on their ability to process the information so being able to read the information to people and and I like this just allows it to be more accessible that sort of thing yeah it is, yeah I like to think of it as a great pursuit yeah I like to be able to allow people to learn new things and that sort of thing because we're often you know biased by the um by the people around us and their opinions so being able to like readily access academic information and even just like storytelling like novels which people have always wanted to read I'm able to read you know, read to them and express great stories, which otherwise would be trapped in the pages, which they wouldn't be able to understand or they find too daunting to start. So yeah, the exchange of knowledge and entertainment, which is otherwise like hard for people to experience, that's that's definitely my aim with me streaming. <clears throat> Sorry, I just want to see if I'm able to build up something more regular, something which people can experience in a in a way which I'm able to you know be able to produce it in greater quality because I want to get a bit of microphone and a bit of computer and stuff so that people can actually you know be entertained by my content to a greater degree than just you know discussion and beyond that I want people to experience entertainment in academia in a fun way so that they're able to so it's more digestible <sighs> yeah and something that I definitely want to achieve And also, it's sort of like a fun way for me to experience readings that are provided for me to learn anyway. Yeah, it'll definitely be more difficult. But, you know, I mean, new, new genres have always been started out. I mean, I'm also posting these VODs to YouTube. I've tried to edit them before, but it was just this whole escapade of, like, of terrible stuff that just kept on happening. The software kept failing. And... um I wasn't able to transport the um the video when I finally made it after three days of editing it because the software just kept crashing and unsaving my progress. I eventually finished it, tried to post it, and it didn't work. Yeah, so 
uh, I'm just posting the unedited vods from from Twitch on YouTube so that people can view them, but it's not great. <sighs> Sorry. Yeah, even if you do know what ed good editing software, my computer is very old and very unreliable. It's a, it's a 2014 MacBook, so <laughs> it's not great. I, uh, I'm doing the best I can with what I have, and I'll see if I can improve my my, my hardware and software later on. But, but yeah, a MacBook, yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's notoriously terrible, I know, but it's, it is, it's what I was given. It's what I was able to get. <laughs> I know. Uh, <laughs> mm. Yeah, I've been trying to get like better streaming technology and stuff, but the stuff that's accessible for MacBook is very, very limited. Yeah, I mean, MacBooks are good for like documentation and like writing up stuff and that sort of thing, but like it's, it's terrible for gaming and streaming and those general types of activities. But you know. I'm trying my best. We're doing the best that we can with what we have. Ah, okay. <laughs> ah, I think we're almost done as well. We're almost there. We've almost finished it. I've been streaming for four and a half hours. <laughs> I love discussing stuff with you, but I can I can feel my jaw hurting. My mouth is in pain. <laughs> but I will finish it. I swear, I will finish this. <sighs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> I still don't understand how people can do streamers bonds where they stream for days or even months on end. That sounds absolutely horrendous. How did they do it? I don't understand. How can you talk for that long? And then I guess they aren't reading something aloud for several hours. There'll be times where they're sleeping and or like not talking much because they're playing a game or something, but like cheapers, that sounds terrible. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, where was I up to? Mm -hmm. Okay, I was up to here. The cell phone complicates, the cell phone camera complicates traditionally surveillance dynamics because it can be used to reinforce Force existing inequalities as well as encounter them. However, defining what is abnormal or picture worthy remains a part of cultural ideologies that is inescapable when their impact is illustrated as a central part of how the gaze operates against disabled people and more specifically people with dwarfism. Okay, we're up to the conclusion. The conclusion of this article. Yeah. The experience of unauthorized picture taking of people with dwarfism can be analyzed in several ways. This article has examined the historical cultural representations of people with dwarfism to, to contextualize how they have been objectified and marked as visually interesting, justifying a gaze on their bodies. The portrayal of. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Uh, okay. A betrayal of people with dwarfism as sources of entertainment to be mocked and influenced to be mocked influences their experiences with strangers in public places and manifests in the gaze directed at them. This gaze can be analyzed in conjunction with that of a racialized and sexualized gaze, which enacts surveillance, scrutiny, and control o over both back. Oh no, there was a spelling error. <laughs> black and brown. Oh, it means black and brown. And female bodies. Photography has been utilized to define the, the category of those marked as other. Photography exploitation has cemented ideals of normality and relegated the abnormal as deviant. The use of cell phone cameras has changed how frequently pictures are taken in everyday life and has transformed the power of, to document 
or is defined as abnormal. The, the combination of these influences can be attributed to be significant in the experience of unauthorized picture taking of people with autism. Yeah, spelling error in an academic paper. I can see how they could miss it though, because if you were just like reading through it, they use the phrase um, 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 black and brown bodies repeatedly throughout the paper and they continuously spelled it correctly. But they had, in this one, they, um, they probably mistyped the L and after like skimming reading it multiple times, the people probably editing, they just probably missed it. It is like a one letter spelling <laughs> mistake. But I guess because I'm reading it aloud, I'm able to pick up on them very, very easily. I think that's the only one that I found in this paper, though. So it's like, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> I don't really care. Um, da -da 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 -da. Defined as abnormal, the combination of the influence attributed to be significant in the experience of unauthorized picture taking of people with dwarfism. Yay. It is done. Both articles have been said. Yay! <laughs> oh, I'm finished. This is so good. Yes. Ah, thank you. <laughs> oh, okay. That is done. Oh, the reason why I thought this was a lot thicker than it actually was is because they have four whole pages of references. Bruh. So it wasn't actually that long. It was about normal length, but they just had a lot of references, which is nice. Uh, okay. Beautiful. Okay. <sighs> okay, I am quite tired and my vocal cords are very sore. But if there's anything that you want to talk about before I leave off here and go off and sleep because it is quite late where I am now. Yeah. Do you, do you have anything that you want to say or anything like that? Feel free. Uh. <sighs> okay. Well, thank you for the follow anyway. I had very interesting discussions with you. It was very nice to, to talk to somebody for an extended period. Usually when I talk to people in my chat, it's usually the usual, oh, um, what country do you live in? Or, um, or hey, what are you streaming? And they're like, oh, cool. They'll listen for a bit, then they'll, they'll pop off, which is fine. But um, having in-depth conversations like this is very refreshing for me. So thank you for sticking around for a while. <sighs> okay. I did you a nice day? in the UK, you're probably like 12, so it's like midday for you-ish in the UK, I'm guessing. Because it's, yeah, because it's almost 11 o'clock at night where I am, so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, midday. Cool. <laughs> it's almost midnight here, baby. Yeah. <laughs> ah, beautiful. Okay, good night. Yeah, have a nice day. <laughs>